This is Agriculture Today. We are joined now by K-State Grain Economist Dan O'Brien for this week's Grain Market Update. As always, we're going to start with our futures and cash, our local prices that we've seen over the past week or so. And Dan, this week's been a bit of a tumultuous one, right? Well, yes. Uh, the um, the price volatility, I, I guess, especially for, for wheat, we've seen some upward movement. And after after a good long time of of prices not being very very positive here now for the uh, for the last well I, five to ten trading days we we've, we've come up from a, well basically from a low of about eight dollars now up to about eight eighty and three quarters having traded up near you know getting closer to nine dollars uh, so that that is a change in attitude and narrative in the market uh, part of that has, has has come from stronger exports. Uh, we did uh, for, for the week ending the 26th of January. We had uh, about 18 million uh, metric, ton, 18 million uh, bushels of, of uh, U.S. wheat exports total, and that's pretty near the the USDA pace that's needed to meet the to meet the, uh, uh, the their projections. Uh, we uh, particularly for hard red winter wheat. You know, we'd been struggling struggling along at one or two or three million metric million bushels, and uh, did jump up to over five in that at in uh in that time frame and um the thing that's been holding the wheat market back has been at least credited to be to have been uh strong russian sales of course they had all of all of their wheat they're projecting and it seems like in the areas they occupied in in ukraine they th those wheat supplies were, were available to them it probably those probably have gone too although there's lots of controversy over that uh so uh and any wheat that uh, that Ukraine had there, with their low currency, they're uh, they're basically, in, as I've talked about in the ag press, they're, they're talking about fire sale prices. Basically, they want to move it; they need the currency. So uh, you've got all that happening, and and really sort of being at the front of a lot of world world markets. Well, uh, you get to the place where eventually those those supplies aren't as plentiful. You you work them down some, and now, uh, you know, it's. Uh, February, February, early February now, February 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and um, we're one month away from breaking dormancy for wheat. Some areas of Western Kansas have moisture, others don't. Others don't. Some areas have snow cover and, and others don't. So cold temperatures and that are, are uh, all of concern. So, so you wonder what's happening tumultuously in the futures. A lot of it's been happening in the wheat market. I uh, would say that uh, you know, we're almost now for for soybean futures. Uh, we built it. We build in this trend, uh, literally an expectation of continued higher prices. And uh, we're uh, we closed uh, uh, yesterday at at fifteen dollars thirty four cents for the uh, for the um, March lead futures contract. Certainly a trend up over the last bit of time. Uh, if you look at the weekly futures, we've been trending up basically from a low of thirteen. Well. Um, you have to, you know, you, you, you hold these charts and you have so much movement, you have to double check them. Uh, 1350 back in October of 2022. And in kind of a, yes, somewhat of a tortured path, but still stand back and look at it fairly consistent. Now we've worked our way up to 1630 or so on, for, for the, uh, for, well, uh, excuse me, fit, fit that same 1528, 1530 that we were talking about. So, uh, a lot of that, I think, is credited to worries about about Argentina, as you and I have talked about. They've had some rains. Are they enough to offset all the damage they had, er had earlier? Uh, we'll see. So that's, uh, I, I think, th that's the main underlying unsettling factor that's that's held up the soybean market. The corn market, uh, uh, if, if anything, uh, we've uh, almost had less excitement in the corn than you'd almost expect <laughs> given all, given all of us happening in the last last bit of time so we've closed uh, yesterday at 675 and a quarter and have been really just sort of uh of slowly moving around uh, if, if there's a, a word in the country that's being talked about it's that that hey people must have their needs met for now uh I, and i don't doubt that uh, if we had had more clamoring to get to uh to um uh, get hold of or to 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 gain control of of uh, any local supplies or anything still in storage. We'd see str even stronger basis than we're at, but but we at least we don't for this time. I still hold 
the question out as to where we'll be once we get into the summer and and uh, and maybe the supplies that we have right now apparently are are uh, uh, getting closer to being done. So we'll we'll see where that goes. So I I, I would say that uh, the, these pr tr price trends that we're in. Um, uh, again, I, I, I guess I have have in mind my general paradigm that that historically at most of our price strength has come in the last five to 10 years during uh, May and June. And if we then if we have short crops from there, we tend to tend to go sideways to lower. And if we have big crops, we go lower strong more strongly into harvest. But but here we are now in February and uh, a lot of times February does show Historically, it's a pretty narrow trading range month, moving higher for for corn and for soybeans. For wheat, a lot of times it's moving sideways, uh, a, a little bit of volatility, breaking dormancy. If we have weather issues heading into March, but uh, but generally we move sideways to a little bit higher coming through February. But but then once we get in the fields, we start worrying about moisture and ability to fertilize, get things planted. Then we have a lot more movement. So. I guess any any movement that we're seeing now, like we're seeing in soybeans, is I wouldn't say it's a gift, but it's but uh, it's contrary to what we normally see happening in in these markets in Kansas over time. So I, I guess uh, so uh, that we're that we're not falling off is, is probably well indicative of just how tight supply demand situation situation is around the world and and uh so, so now when we don't have a lot happening we go sideways and in some past years we didn't have a lot happening we go down <laughs> so we're going sideways right now just because there's not a lot of new news yet yeah i guess uh, which one which option you would choose there i'd say we're in pretty good conditions considering uh, yeah. the alternative so yeah right. great great coverage there of futures and our cash markets kind of following the same trends are we seeing that play out locally as well well, the, with the move higher in the wheat markets, we, we have seen, uh, you know, 30, 40 plus cents in improvement in, in cash wheat prices. I don't know who still has wheat. I think commercials probably still have wheat in storage and, and elevators, but I'm not sure how many farmers still have wheat. Uh, but, you know, you're seeing now wheat, wheat prices very consistently running from a, well, a low in Southeast Kansas. That, and we're taking the high prices in, in these different regions, but so the highest of the elevator bids uh, in the, uh, Around the Columbus area, eight twenty-two on the low side. So again, well over eight dollars, moving up to as high as uh, eight eight seventy-five in Salina, eight sixty-five in Hutchinson, and of course those are those are major export uh, milling milling areas. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Topeka, eight fifty-five, eight fifty-six, Garden City, eight forty-eight in Colby. So all good. Uh, uh, producers are probably now uh, wondering what what their production uh, prospects are, and if they if they think they have good subsoil, if they're pretty confident about where the market's going, new crop bids uh, are are all at basically the the lowest new crop bid in these same same locations is seven ninety seven, and the highest highest ones are basically eight thirty in Topeka and Garden City. So interesting that you know, Garden City isn't a major milling center or even even a trend a major a major historic transport center at uh for for wheat uh in in kansas but it had it's tied for the highest price right now in as uh along with topeka for for movement so i guess that the dryness down there and the the uh uh thirst for feedable feedable uh um uh grain is is probably uh probably playing into that Absolutely. And I know that our markets probably, you know, we can anticipate potentially some more volatility to come in two weeks yeah. or so. And that's specifically because of the USDA Outlook Conference that's going on in D.C., which you will be in attendance of. So tell us a bit about uh, that. Myself and Guy Allen will be there. And uh, that that conference is uh, uh, probably most of the time, the first public rollout of what the USDA's projections are for the coming year. And uh, they do give a preliminary uh, preliminary uh, view of that and put that out in in uh, pardon me in um, November and uh, my take is that the USDA starts out conservative and where the acres are are not on the low side for most of these commodities the yields tend to be on the high side 
and the prices are 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 not are are not that terribly high. For instance, their, their numbers uh, for for corn that that they already have put out preliminary to that conference, showing a um, well uh, about a, a planted area of about ninety two million acres. That would be up some. So that's that's they uh, raised their preliminarily raised their corn. Uh, Planted acres from uh, from 88, 89 up to 92. So that's they're they're indicating. Well, gosh, it looks like people are going to plant corn uh, on their soybean numbers. They're they're essentially sideways for soybeans. No 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 real change at all, or, or just marginal. So uh, in their in their view, uh, U.S. corn farmers, if they increase anything, they'll probably go with go with corn. And if you look at the uh, the soybean corn price ratio right now. It, it uh, is about 2.3, 2 2.35, something like that. And we, our long-term average is about 2.52. So that favors with, with soybean prices, new crop bids are lower relative to corn that favors soybeans. The, the uh, I guess without getting too lost in the weeds on this, they, they uh, tend to project high trend line yields for these crops and, and come in on the high side. On, on production aspects, they're they're already dialing in 181 uh, and a half bushels per acre for their projection, and we haven't ever really had a, above 177. So that's that's uh, a number to watch. We'll say to be to be polite on that. And uh, so with all that, they're they're plugging in a price uh, by the time they work all the way through their supply demand balance sheets of about five dollars and seventy cents. Right now, the futures are projecting about 640, 645. So there's a there's a variance between the USDA's more conservative projection and what the uh, what the futures markets are implicitly projecting for the coming year. And for soybeans, uh, the USDA is projected uh, about uh, thirteen dollars per per bushel for the coming year. From uh, that'd be 2023 24 marketing year. And futures, by the time we we look at that, they're uh, they're uh, somewhat higher. Our own KSU numbers are closer to 14 and a half to 15. So I'm really, really curious about uh, having a KSU contingent at that conference and to talk with these people one-on-one uh, -on -one and to get, yes, I, I see what their, what their numbers are that they put out, but I really would like to understand their, their true feelings about where the risks are this year and what the, if, if their numbers are wrong, what direction are we likely to go into? Absolutely. Yeah, great opportunity to network with some fellow economists from across the country and to get insight, like you said, because a lot of the times it's just the numbers we see. We don't always hear the reasoning. So that'll right. be great for sure. I'm looking forward to our conversations following that conference and all the insight you'll provide us with. Yeah, and we'll see. We'll, um, I hope to, I hope that uh, we could gain some insights on, on what they think is com coming out of these international conflicts. You know, how much uh, how much uh, recovery do they foresee in Ukraine? Uh, and and uh, we're sort of easing our way into saying that, well, we think we're going to be down 20, 30, 40 percent or more, <laughs> you know, in, in the long run. It's not just what happened this year in a war torn year. What do they come out of this with? And how does how is the the world corn market changed because of the damage done to the Ukrainian uh, corn and wheat producing uh, capacity. And, and it's been substantial, not just production, but also on, on as we've seen on the uh, export side. So uh, lot, lots of issues. I, I, I personally think that th that damage as will, will end up and, and lead to even tighter stocks for those crops. We, we just, we've lost, uh, some proportion of our production capacity, but especially our, our export competitiveness out in the world. And and oh, it's not that we're not competitive, we've lost competitors. So for who's left, we'll, we'll tend to have, uh, tend to hold up prices all that much more. Sure, yeah, long-term effects, long effects we can expect to see from that for sure. But Dan, as always, thank you so much for your time. And like I said, you know, we'll hear hopefully from you during that conference. We'll see the setup, how the timeline lays out, but hopefully we'll hear from you while you are the, actually there and then follow up in the weeks ahead to after that. So looking forward to that. Thank you. We'll sure try to make that happen if we can, Samantha. Absolutely. Once again, everyone, that was K-State Grain Economist Dan O'Brien joining us for this week's cat cattle market, this week's grain market update. <laughs> this week's grain market update. We'll be back with more ahead on agriculture today.